I don't think that there is a way to fail motherhood, if I'm honest. I think we feel it all the time. There is nothing that we will be harder on ourselves for than how we raise our children, I don't think. Ever feel like you suck at this job? Motherhood, I mean. Have too much anxiety and not enough patience? Too much yelling, not enough play? There's no manual, no village, no guarantees. The stakes are high. We want so badly to get it right. But this is survival mode. We're just trying to make it to bedtime. So if you're full of mom guilt, your temper scares you. You feel like you're screwing everything up and you're afraid to admit any of those things out loud. This podcast is for you. This is Failing Motherhood. I'm Danielle Batman, and each week we'll chat with a mom ready to be real, sharing her insecurities, her fears, her failures, and her wins. We do not have it all figured out. That's not the goal. The goal is to remind you, you are the mom your kids need. They need what you have, you are good enough, and you're not alone. I hope you pop in earbuds, somehow sneak away, and get ready to hear some hope from the trenches. You belong here, friend. We're so glad you're here. Hey, it's Danielle. Today's episode was such a treat for me to record. I think I have a new best friend in New Zealand. I interviewed Erin and it was so much fun. After we stopped recording, we talked for another like 30, 40 minutes offline. I found it so fun that in different days, due to time zones, opposite weather seasons, different family structures, and paths to becoming a mom, our kids are the same age and they're reading the same graphic novels, have the same toilet humor, and we want the same things for our kids. Erin Hudson is a queer woman married to her wife of 14 years and a non-bio mom to two boys age 10 and 7. Erin always knew she wanted to be a parent, but also knew she had no interest being pregnant and having her own baby. So creating their family was an easy decision, but the challenges of undergoing fertility treatment and raising two boys with little support has definitely required more resilience and strength than she or her wife had planned for. Navigating health difficulties and learning difficulties between their children has now led Erin and her wife down a different path, and they're currently preparing to pack up and take their boys on a world schooling adventure in 2023. So, in honor of Pride Month, I'm excited to feature Erin's story, as unique and as normal as it is. I don't want to give you too long-winded of an introduction because I really do want you to stick to the end of this episode. It gets better and better as we go. Right off the bat, we chat geography, more about her family's plans of traveling the world, how she met her wife, you're not going to believe that story, and then her becoming a non-bio mom. She speaks so honestly about how much she just wants to raise good humans, and I think you'll definitely relate. Here's my interview with Erin. Welcome to Failing Motherhood. My name is Danielle Bettman, and on today's episode, I'm joined by Erin Hodson. Welcome, Erin. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Of course. I am... I'm so excited to just connect with somebody from New Zealand. I'm going to be honest. And like fanning your just whole country, the whole vibe, all of it. (laughs) Well, thanks. I worked really hard on it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Clearly that was all you personally. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. It's sounding so lovely, I have to say, compared to the place we're at as a country. But we won't dive into politics. We'll dive into our own personal stories. So all that aside, tell us, is New Zealand amazing? I mean... I think, yeah, and no, uh, every, every country I think has its good and bad points, you know? Yeah. Like I grew up here clearly from the accent. I've lived here pretty much my whole life. I spent a little bit of time in Australia, but the majority of it has been here in New Zealand and it's a great place to raise children. It's a great place to be when you're a young person. I think the, the cost of living is really high. It's fucking miles away from everything. <laughs> like it is my, it literally takes, you know, I think, so we're looking at relocating next year actually. And uh, the flight that we're looking at leaving New Zealand on is 14 hours. Oh, wow. 
So that kind of gives you an idea of like just how far away everything that might be interesting is. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought about that. So, you know, there, there's good points and bad points in, in that respect, but it is a beautiful country. The The scenery is amazing. The people are generally pretty great and uh, the culture is amazing. And, you know, so there's lots of really positive things. But, you know, equally there are good things to be said about the US and, and other parts of the world as well that I think, you know, sometimes it can be easy to overshadow some of yeah. that stuff. Like some of the best people that I know are, are American and – um. Some of the some of my favorite people in the whole world have been born and raised and never left the US. So you know, I th- I think it's all kind of relative, and it's about what you look for in the world. You'll only ever see what you look for, right? So yeah, I love that perspective. That's really important to remember yeah. because yeah, easily any last lasting current event can you know be the thing that you think about. But there's so much to where we choose to live and our circumstances. And, yeah, yeah. So it's it's fun to be connected with so many people internationally just to be able to know like we're so alike like way more alike than we would be different you know walking down the street yeah yeah i mean the only thing that's different really apart from the accent is just you know that we live in different places and have different surroundings i think you know there's always commonality to be found with anybody in the world i mean we're all human right exactly so i think we forget that sometimes and we forget, you know, the the privilege that that brings of just having that commonality and that that common ground. So, you know, and as mothers, like there will always be so much about what we do every day that is the same. I I don't think that geography really determines whether we're the same or not. So, totally. And and the other thing that's bizarre is that it's Friday your time and Thursday my time. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. And I have to say, Friday is blink and freezing. <laughs> It is really cold because it is also winter here, and uh, I know you're heading into summer vacation. Yes, and it is very hot here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We um we had a really decent frost this morning, and uh, walking walking the children to school, we were all like marveling at how much of our breath we could see, and like it was uh, yeah, it's it's freezing, but it's Friday, and that's always a win. So my, I was just talking to my podcast editor, and she's in Australia. And it's obviously winter there too. And she was talking about how cold it is. How cold does it get? <laughs> no, not as cold as Australia. I can tell you that for free. Okay. So we are, we live right at the bottom of New Zealand. So we're at the bottom of the South Island. Okay. The temperatures here, and again, we're you know because we're New Zealand, we're centigrade or Celsius rather than oh right Fahrenheit, right? So yeah. there's that difference. But if I do a really quick conversion. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't generally get out of single digits in the winter. Um, and I say that and I know people will go, whoa, that's really cold. But actually... It's still, yeah, around 32, right? Yeah. Yeah, Fahrenheit. it's um, 10 degrees uh, Celsius is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, we're, we're anywhere up to about 50 on any given day. We certainly don't get the extreme cold temperatures, but we are very, very close to Antarctica. And where we live is um, a, a port city, so we're right on the, the coastline and we often get Antarctic winds. So the wind chill can be really cold, but we don't, you know, I mean, we know Canada, don't get me, like we don't sit in the negatives like for days and days and days on end. So, yeah. Still in my mind, I'm thinking that you're just like tropical year round. So this is blowing my mind. Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all. In fact, where we live, because we're so far south, we don't have really hot summers either okay we sort of mid-20s is about as much as we get which i think is around about 75 ish okay that sounds lovely i'm gonna be honest (laughs) yeah yeah i mean i'm not gonna lie i actually really like the hot so 77 is 25 okay so you know we we hit 25 and we're like oh it's a really beautiful day and that's 77 the north island gets a lot warmer And even the north of the South Island gets a lot warmer. So there's different, there's, you know, New Zealand is a small country in terms of population. And we say, you know, like we're, we're quite little. I mean, there's 5 million people here in the whole country, but geographically we're actually quite big. Like if you put us over Europe, we would cover France and some of Spain, I think, and the UK, like we're quite quite spread out um, and there's quite a lot of the country that's not really inhabited by people so it's kind of deceptive 
because people think well, it's a small country, you've got not many people, so everybody's kind of living in the same environment. But actually, we're quite spread out and there's really different climates throughout the country. So it's really, really cool. Okay, this is fascinating. <laughs> I did not bring you on the podcast just to grill you about geography, but we got a bonus lesson. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We did we did sort of say we'd just go where the the conversation goes. We did. So So here we are. Totally cool. (laughs) Comparing Celsius and Fahrenheit. (laughs) So yeah. We'll go we'll get back to why we're here. I shared your bio at the beginning, but go ahead and just introduce yourself to my listeners and tell us who you are and who's in your family. All right. My name's Erin and I have just turned 40. So I'm sort of a born and bred and grown up <laughs> in New Zealand kind of a, a person, pretty laid back. Um, I think I'm pretty standard Kiwi. I think most people are pretty casual about life here and, you know, I'm pretty easygoing about that sort of stuff. I've been married to my wife for, if I get this wrong, I'm in trouble, but I think. <laughs> 14 years in October. Okay. And we've been together for just over 15 years now. And I grew up in the North Island and she grew up in the South Island. And when we first started going, you know, dating or going out or whatever you call it these days with the cool kids, (laughs) um, (laughs) she moved to the North Island and absolutely hated it and was like, I'm going back to the South Island. You can come if you really want. And I was like, well, that's a very tempting invitation. <laughs> sure. Um, so, so we came down and we've been living here ever since. And, uh, you know, it's, it's where she's always been comfortable. And our, our boys, uh, we have two children. Asha is 10, nearly 11. And Luca is seven, nearly eight. And uh, yeah, they're like, they were born here. They've never lived anywhere else. And they are, are very, what's the word I'm looking for? They're very, very different children to the type of children that I thought I would have. Mm. They're not biologically my children. They're biologically my wife's children. And, you know, we'll have a bit of a conversation, no doubt, about how all of that went. But, um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're great kids. And uh, as a family, we we don't have a lot of family around. Despite my wife being from here, her mum passed away when our eldest was just little, like he was one. And her father still lives here, but... Beyond that, we don't have a lot of family around. We have a lot of fantastic friends and, you know, they're they're really great. But we're actually in the process of packing everything up and uh, selling most of what we own and heading uh, overseas to see what the world holds for us as a family. And uh, so that's exciting. And, you know, the kids are excited about it, but it's also somewhat intimidating. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. Yeah. that yeah, sounds in a roundabout way. So exciting. Back to geography. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, tell me more about that. Like the whole, we're going to globally track around the world in 2023. What? Tell me more about your plans. Well, um, so the intention at this point is to um, leave in early February, leave New Zealand and head to Canada for six months. Okay. Trip around Canada. Originally, we thought we might do some of the US, but I'm not going to lie, that's more intimidating that we than we feel brave enough to do at this point. Fair, fair. Which makes me really sad, but also, you know, I'm hopeful that that will change over time and that we will have that opportunity at some point. And then we're heading off to the UK after Canada and uh, and spending some time in traveling around Europe. I've got Italian roots and French roots, as well as, you know, the British colonial sort of ancestry. So um, I want to visit those places my wife is a British citizen. Um, her mum was born and grew up in Scotland. So she has citizenship, but she's never been there. Oh, wow. Uh, and as as we've got older, the pull to go and see those roots and, and see where our people come from, and um, and especially for my wife with her, her mum passing away, it's just got stronger and stronger for her that she wants to to reconnect with those roots and uh, yeah. And then my kids are like, can we go to Greece and see, you know, the Parthenon and can we go to, you know, all these different things. They want to go in Rome and that they're excited about the opportunity to go and see different things that they've kind of only really seen. Like one of them is really excited about going to the Eiffel tower and uh, being able to eat a 
yes. from France because <laughs> he's a real foodie. <laughs> And, you know, and the other one's like, oh, I really want to go to the Louvre and I want to see um, the Mona Lisa in person. Like, so, you know, it's exciting and uh, we're fortunate enough that there's, we both feel the same sort of enthusiasm for it. I, I think, you know, it, it would be really easy for one of us to say, oh, that's too scary or that's too hard or that's, you know, but what about what the life we have here? But if I'm honest, COVID definitely killed that vibe mm-hmm. because we felt trapped as soon as the world shut down. And uh, so now we're like, nah, let's do it. Like we always talked about traveling. Neither of us did it when we were younger. And we, we always said once the kids have left home, we're out. Like, you know, if they don't leave home, we will. That's totally fine. <laughs> but, and and now we're kind of like actually we want to spend that time with the children. We want to, we want to have adventures with them yeah. and – and we also, you know, I think it's it's easy to kid yourself that you've got forever, yeah. but we know that's not the case. Yeah. And uh, we've had we've certainly had friends lose, you know, life partners and things that have made us go. Actually, we don't want to wait because there's no one else I want to do it with, and uh, and I certainly don't want to not do it just because she's not here or I'm not here. You know, like I I think it's really important to just live life while you can, and uh, and there's a lot of world out there to see so we better hurry up and get started yeah (laughs) so like logistically do you have to like sell your place and like what are you doing to prepare well we're going to keep the house okay yeah we're going to keep the house we're going to sell everything in it pretty much but the house will keep for now the housing market here is horrific you know we bought this house 10 years ago and it's just about tripled in value in 10 years and you know and the the price of housing is just astronomical and and continues to rise and i think for us that while we don't have any intention necessarily to come back and live in this house it feels like it's something that we've invested in for our children and so it, it's something that for now we will maintain you know if we decide to settle somewhere at some point we might sell it in order to invest somewhere else but for now it feels like it's kind of that it's it's that safety net for our children so sense. if something happens to to us they've got you know some security and and somewhere to be and somewhere to you know to kind of put roots back down and somewhere that's familiar yeah so for now that's the plan yeah um and everything else goes <laughs> and uh yeah that's you know that's a, a process in itself that's oh totally yeah, that's a lot of work. Challenge challenges all of us in different ways. Yeah, <laughs> and then you're planning to homeschool. Uh, we're planning to world school. So um, homeschool, you know, implies that you're following a curriculum and some sort of structure. We're not intending to do that. We don't have to do that because we don't have to stay enrolled in schooling here in New Zealand because we're traveling, and so uh, we don't really feel the need to have an enrollment and and you know keep a curriculum going as such, not going to lie. School doesn't work for our older son. He's, um, he has some learning, learning challenges that he gets great support with at school, but school doesn't light him up. And he's actually really, really clever when he's engaged in experiential learning. And so we were like, well, what better way to do it than to take him out into the world and say, actually, you know, here's all these different things that you can try and and do and experience and the learning that you get from that will you know will carry you further forward in life I think for him than it would if he was in a classroom yeah and our younger son is super duper smart (laughs) and uh picks up everything really easily so um I don't think he'll have any challenges either so at this point the intention is just to world school them they're both really into museums and that kind of stuff so We'll do lots of museum tr- tours and art galleries and, you know, lots of historical stuff. They're excited about going to some place in Canada that has like a cannon and like all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, they're doing their own little research. They've got their own little vision boards of what they want to see in the world. And Oh, my gosh, so fun. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's nice to see them already expanding their worldview and recognizing that what they live with isn't everything. Yeah. Because I think that's – that's the danger of living in New Zealand, I think, is that because you're so isolated from the rest of the world, you do get this crazy perception that this is what the world is like. And actually, it, it's not at all. And 
it blows their mind that we could maybe one day live in a house that was built before New Zealand was even discovered, you know, because we're quite a young country as well. Sure. Yeah. Here, an old house was built in the 1880s, you know, and like we're looking at like some of these houses in England that were built in like the 1600s and 1700s and the kids are just like, whoa, that's mind blowing, you know. So, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exciting to be able to expand their worldview and to be able to offer them opportunities to see different ways of being in the world and different ways of connecting with other people and that sort of stuff. Like that's really important to us that they just grow up to be good humans and, and you can't learn that in a classroom. So that's kind of, yeah, one of the drivers behind it, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'll have to like follow up with you in a year and see how it's going <laughs> and like find me. <laughs> take all your notes. Yeah. If I can get a hold of you. <laughs> yeah. And might even be in the same time zone by that point. You that's never true. Know. That's true. I, I certainly won't be in the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that sounds yeah. so amazing to be able to offer that opportunity to your kids at this age, because I have similar age kids. Mine are almost eight on Saturday and then nine. And wow. they, yeah, they're 15 months apart. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but they're in such like a sweet spot. Like I really like this age because they, yeah, they can take care of themselves, but also they still want to be around us and like hang out and yeah. want our attention all the time. And like, yeah, yeah, I feel like it's such a nice time to spend this time as a family and make the most of it. So I'm super jealous and yeah. we have to take all all the notes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, what to do and what not to do. <laughs> Hey, if you're new here, I'm Danielle. My company, Wholeheartedly, offers one-on-one and group coaching programs to help families with strong-willed kids age 1 to 7 prevent tantrums, eliminate power struggles, extend their patience, and get on the same page. It's kind of like finances. You can read lots of info about what a Roth IRA is and how the stock market works. But if you really want to get serious about paying down debt or growing your wealth, you go see a financial advisor who can give you very specific recommendations based on all the unique facets of your situation. I'm your financial advisor for parenting, and I've designed the way we work together to give you nothing less than a complete transformation. While we work together, I'm able to help you figure out why your child is losing their mind and why you are losing your mind and guide you to master effective long-term solutions through three main focuses. Number one, my cultivating cooperation guide, teaching you the tools of positive discipline. Number two, managing your mind by working through my triggers workbook. And number three, establishing your family's foundation by writing your family business plan. My coaching is comprehensive, practical, individualized, and full of VIP support. So if you struggle to manage your child's big emotions, If you and your partner's arguments seem to center around parenting, especially if one of you is too kind and one of you is too firm, if you struggle to stay calm and be the parent that you want to be, it's possible to stop feeling like a deer in headlights when a tantrum hits, effortlessly move through simple directions and care routines without an argument, and go to bed replaying the way you handled the hardest moments and feel proud. If you have a deep desire to be the best parent you can be, and your family is your greatest investment. Find me on Instagram, send me a message that says sanity, and I'll ask you a few questions to see if we'd be a good fit to work together. I can't wait to meet you. Back to the show. Our eldest son, part of his like world schooling experience will be he wants to start a YouTube channel. Very fun. And um and vlog about all of the different things that we do and you know, so that he can show his friends back in New Zealand and so that he can send it to my parents and that sort of stuff. And so that's part of his his journey. Uh and you know, I've said to him, like, I'm happy to show him how to edit videos and stuff like that. So that will be part of his learning experience as we travel. That's so such a needed skill set right now. Yeah. Right. And he loves that stuff. Like, I mean, yeah. he's a 10 year old boy. So like if he's not plugged into something, <laughs> he starts to wilt. 
<laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so that's part of it. And then I also think I'll probably start a blog. And particularly because we're two women traveling with two boys, I think that's a really unique challenge that faces us. You know, I'm not going to lie. My wife freaks out about the thought of having to send our boys into the, the bathrooms at an airport, just the two of them. And, and things like that, you know? Yeah. And so there's that kind of aspect of it that we've tried to seek out similar experiences and we haven't found it anywhere. So um, that's that's probably something that I'll blog a bit of, a bit about and, and share, Definitely. you know, our experiences with. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's exciting. It's Super exciting to exciting. do different things and, and to connect with people, you know, like people like you who have similar age children, like we're all about, We've got friends in, in a whole pile of different places that have kids of all different ages. And we're like, we just want to take our kids to experience other kids, you know, to, to be able to say, actually, like these kids grew up in Canada, like they've learned to ice skate so that they can play ice hockey with my friend's son in Edmonton. And, you know, they're learning French because I've got a friend in France who her children only speak French and they're like, well, we've got to be able to talk to him. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like, you know, that, that motivation, again, that human connection thing yeah, is the thing that I think shapes the experience and, um, and they're all in on all of it. So it's great. My, my kids are also learning French, not for that same reason, but that's just what their school offers. <laughs> so I'm hoping nice. that they become our translators when we go back to Paris, because we went to Paris for our honeymoon. Nice. The Eiffel Tower does live up to the hype, so definitely get the croissant right. and the, all the pastries and <laughs> yeah. the macaroons and make the most of it. Yeah. They, ha- they have these little salespeople that like come around for keychains, and so just get a keychain. But yeah, no, it says... Yeah. Why, why not? Yeah. Right. Yeah, like, exactly. Why not? Exactly. And I think being able to show them that there, there's kids their age that are, they have more similarities with than yeah. not as I think such a cool thing that you yeah, got, you can't learn other than just doing it. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? Like I think we grow up and certainly the world today feels very divisive feels very like I have to exclude people because they're not the same as me or I look for the difference as a reason to not be connected to people. And that really just hurts my heart as a parent that that that's how children are being raised and I don't feel good about that. So it's very much like, actually, if that child's different, go and learn about that difference. Go and understand why that is, you know, not actually as big as you think it is and how through that difference you will have commonality. Yes. And and I think that's that's such an important skill for children to pick up that we don't put enough focus on. Um, you know, probably because there's a pile of other things that are, are seemingly more important, right? But um But are they though? Yeah. 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 No, I I yeah. and at my house I have taught my kids that there are basically two groups of people. People that believe that differences are good and people that believe that differences are bad. And then that shapes how they react to those differences and what they decide to do as a result. And so like they're very much of the camp of differences are good. They are to be celebrated. They are to be sought out. And and so we have like signs up in our house that say everyone's different. Everyone belongs. And that's a really core part of like who we are as a family. But again, that, that only is translated then when they're able to see that modeled through how we interact with others or how we encourage them to seek those relationships out. And so that's a big part of you know, why we want them to be more open-minded and, and have that worldview sense as well. Yeah. So very alike in that sense. And see, that's why one day we'll be able to visit the US is because people are raising children like yours. And that's like, that's something that I want our children to see as well is that, you know, for all the bad things that you see in the media and all of the things where people are hurting each other or discriminating against each other or oppressing each other, like, that all comes from such a wounded space and such a space of like generational trauma now. 100%. And actually like we don't, we get to choose whether we carry that forward or not. Mm-hmm. And and we're choosing not to. Yes. And um, not everybody will make that choice and not everybody feels like they have a choice around that. But if we do and we make a conscious choice not to be that way, then that allows other people around us to see that actually they can make a choice too. And that that's the only way that, anything is going to get better. And, you know, we can do that here in our little community where, you know, my kids go to school with 120 kids. Like it's, you know, we're, we're in a small space or we can go into the world and we can stand in the middle of 
London town, as they call it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, we can stand in London town by Big Ben. And I'm like, yes, you can. And they're like, we could have a sign that says we love everybody. And I'm like, yep, you totally can. Oh, yes. Like, if that's what you want to do, I'll help you write it. Like, let's yes. do it. You know, and that's the kind of experience. And, and that's what makes me proud as a parent. Like it makes me, feel, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I've totally fucked them up and I'm going to have to pay for therapy at some point. <laughs> we but, all are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, there are moments where I'm just so overwhelmingly proud and question whether that's my influence or whether that's just the people that they are. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, probably just the people that they are. But um, they're pretty great little people. But, but you're allowing them to be those people. Yeah. Well, you know, I try as long as they you yeah. know, do the things they have to do as well. <laughs> yes. Like they also put their shoes on yeah. and generally, yeah, <laughs> treat people. Yeah, well. and you know, pick their laundry up and, yes. and do all the all Minor the things details. like put their dishes away. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. As long as long as they, you know, good housemates. Yes. Then uh, they can also be good people. I think that is fair. Yes. <laughs> so I I feel like we've had a whole episode already, but I want to know more about you. So how did you meet your wife? <laughs> Funny story that. Uh, so. I worked for a big organization, like a national organization in the North Island, and she worked for the same organization in the South Island. And she used to ring me every day for help. Uh, so I was like a, a technical advisor and she would call and say, oh, I've got this, this client that needs this. I don't know where to find the information. She'd only just started and I'd been there for like four or five years. And she, like, I'd talk to her probably, you know, sometimes 15, 20 times a day. Oh my um, God. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, because she, you know, she had lots of questions. She was just starting and, and that was kind of the, what I was there for. And then like, I, you know, I'd do stupid things. Like I'd send an email out to everybody in the center, but the center was across two cities and I'd accidentally send it to the whole center and say, Hey, I'm coming around with a raffle for such and such, you know, charity or whatever. <laughs> if you've got, if you want to, you know, just let me know and I'll come to your desk and pick up your money. And she'd send little messages back going, I've got $5 here if you want to come and get it. And I was just like, okay, she's kind of funny. Uh -huh. um, and at the time I was like, I was engaged to someone else. Oh. I was in a committed relationship, very, you know, happy on track with life and all of the things. And, uh, and then one day she, she said to me, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to a concert tonight with my ex and I really wish it wasn't her that I was going with. I wish it was you at that exact moment I felt like everything in my life just stopped and I can't I can't explain it in any way shape or form it was just that was on the Friday night and by Monday morning I'd left my partner and I had said to my wife do you want to come up and see how we go wow um, and so she came for a visit and uh yeah, and pretty much before she'd even visited, like before we even had met face to face, we'd established that we were going to get married and have children and live happily ever after. Oh my gosh! And uh, and that's where we're at, fifteen years later. So yeah, like I, it was just one of those, like I I kind of describe it as a great remembering. Like I have been with her in another lifetime. I know her, and I knew as soon as we met, as we connected, I just knew there was more than what I could see. And yeah. And I just, I, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. She changed my life completely in all the best ways. And, uh, you know, and then we had beautiful children together and now we're on our next adventure and yeah, like it, it was, a oh, I'm so happy for you guys. Yeah. But it was a bit of a rocky start. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> that is not how it usually yeah, goes. You. No, no, it's not. <laughs> At least timeline wise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And, uh, you know, she moved to the, the North Island and hated it, like I said. And, uh, so <laughs> then we, we moved back down to the South Island and in the process of moving back to the South Island, I lost my job because there wasn't the same role in, in the South Island. So, um, so I had to go and find another job, but she's still with the same company now. And yeah, like, you know, it's just one of those stories that like, if you, if I heard it from someone else, I'd be like, that's nuts. <laughs> you know, like it, it's a, a nuts kind of a story to just say like, oh yeah, I met my wife on the phone at work. Yeah. But yeah, there you have it. That's how it happened. That That's so cool. Yeah. It's a good story for the grandkids, right? It is. It is. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially that it didn't like completely blow up in your face like a year later. I mean, that really is a win. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. And, you know, I mean, it, it hasn't it hasn't always been easy. Like, of course, when you when, I think lots of people will recognize when you when you have a relationship that starts long distance, you don't really get that dating stage. And, you know, people joke all the time about lesbians with U-Hauls, like second date, they're moving in together. I mean, it was almost first date for us that we moved in together because we never had the opportunity to live apart and in the same city. And, yeah. and so, you know, like those that presented challenges and all of that sort of stuff as well. And then, yeah, you know, it was, it's, it's been a, a, an interesting ride, but there's no one I would have rather done it with. And yeah. And we're so blessed because we have a, a beautiful life together. So yeah, it's great. So I know you had shared with me before that you always knew you wanted to be a parent. Yeah. But you also always knew that you had no interest being pregnant. Oh, hell yeah. Like, who who wants to do that? <laughs> like, seriously, you have to be a little bit nuts to want to be pregnant. Like, you get the swollen feet and you get, the, like, all the cravings. No, no, not for me at all. I'm way too selfish. But um, how, how <laughs> early did you know that? Um, like, is that something you've just always known? Well... The funny thing is, like, I remember being about four and we had this, like, outdoor house that my dad had made into, like, a little, we called it a Wendy house. I don't know what you call it in the States, like a little playhouse thing. The little boy that lived behind us um, used to come and play and I used to make him be the mum because I wanted to be the dad. <laughs> and I'd go and be like, oh, no, no, I'm going to work. You stay home with the kids. <laughs> And so, yes, so like, I, I think it. I kind of always knew uh -huh. that, um, that I wanted to be a non-traditional parent. What that looked like, I didn't know. I was open to everything. You know, we talked about adoption. We talked about fostering. We talked about all those kinds of things. But there's a lot of barriers for same-sex couples here in New Zealand around adoption and, and that type of thing. And, and actually, my wife really wanted to have a baby crazy person like she was like <laughs> you know she was like no I really want to have a I really want to be pregnant I really want to have a baby I really want it to be my biology that gets passed down I'm like cool you do you boo and I'll be over here like <laughs> having it having a beer while you do it like <laughs> um, no I mean I I like I can't think of anything more beautiful than holding the child that your partner has created right like I don't think there's anything more beautiful than that and you know it was it was a really rocky process. We went onto a waiting list to have fertility treatment. We had an anonymous donor, so you know when the kids are older, they can find more information out about who he is and all of that sort of stuff. But we were on a waiting list for three and a half years after getting married before we got a phone call. Well, we 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 gave them a call and we're like, hey, like we've been on the waiting list for a long time and. You told us originally it'd be up to two years. It's three and a half years later. And they're like, oh, we took you off the waiting list because we hadn't heard from you. We're like, hmm, can you put us back on, please? <laughs> so they put us back on. And the next week we got a call saying, hey, there's donors that you can come in and have a look at. So we there were five to choose from. We both looked at them separately and both came to the same conclusion around who we wanted. So it was kind of it was an easy cool. decision from that perspective. The donor is a lot like my dad and my father-in-law. Um, he's an engineer -y type. He works with his hands. My parents have a house bus and he, you know, built his own house bus and traveled around New Zealand. And so there were lots and lots of things that were just like, yep, this is the kind of person that like, if we go that way, it'll feel like our children have a more of a connection to our fathers, which is important. So yeah, so we went down that path and then my wife got preeclampsia, uh, at towards the end of her pregnancy and so our our eldest was born uh just after 35 weeks oh wow but he was only uh do you work in pounds or pounds yeah you work pounds yeah so he was three pound 14 oh wow when he was born that is well perfect little miniature human and there was nothing medically wrong with him wow at all he he just needed to be born and as soon as he came out he started to thrive. And uh, so the first two weeks of parenthood, we spent in the hospital fattening the little dude up so that he was allowed to come home. And, uh, you know, and my wife had been really sick. So she struggled initially because, you know, she was still in the hospital bed herself having treatment. And, you know, he, he was on a different floor of the hospital in a different space and he couldn't feed because he was so little. So we had to feed him by tube and like it was, it was a really challenging first experience. Yeah. And so, you know, but he, he 
turned out great. He's, you know, perfectly healthy now and um, normal, grunty, stinky, 10-year-old, nearly 11-year-old boy that you would expect him to be. And he's nearly taller than his mother now, so he's, like, excited. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, and then when we decided we wanted to have another one, it, it took quite a long time. I think she, there was a lot of trauma from that first experience for my wife. She knew I didn't want to be pregnant, like I didn't feel the need to pass my genes on. I'm like, look, I don't even like my genes. Why would someone else want them? So I was like, look, you know, if you want, if we want to have another baby, it's it's on you, and I'm not going to force that. But it was really important to her that we didn't have an only child. We decided we'd give it another go, and uh, first try, she got pregnant, and he is like just a hurricane on legs. He's incredible, but he's he's really so full on and uh yeah he's just a real gift but he's a lot like my mother-in-law and he he's the only one of the grandchildren that is like her to look at um and with his mannerisms and stuff like that as well and he didn't meet her he you know he came along a good few years after she passed so it's real it's a beautiful thing that we have that connection to her and uh yeah and he he was also a little bit early and a little bit small he was um 5 pound 4 but he is now he's nearly 8 and he is the size of a 12 year old <laughs> um so he's he's a giant and he just kind of he came out and just started eating and hasn't stopped yeah so we'll have to remortgage the house soon to pay for the groceries <laughs> yeah. but yeah yeah so that's kind of in a nutshell yeah the, uh, yeah parental journey i think the thing for me is that when we had the second child, my wife was very much like, this is your child. Like you're going to be the primary parent here. So there were some logistical challenges around that. Obviously, you know, she was giving birth and birth is traumatic physically. And she really only planned to have six weeks off work and then go back to work. So she went back to work five weeks post birth because she was in hospital for a week before she had him. And I decided that it was important. It was important to both of us that he was still breastfed. So about three months into her pregnancy, I started a breastfeeding or lactation induction regime, which was brutal. I'm not going to lie, you know, taking all these drugs. And at six months, I had to start uh, like when she was six months pregnant, I had to start pumping Oof. like three hourly, like all the time, <laughs> which, you know, like I had to have space at work to do it. I was getting up in the middle of the night to do it. And I'm like, there's not even a fucking baby. Yeah, <laughs> like, what is going that is on? dedication. Yeah, it was, it was really brutal process. Nobody likes their pump. <laughs> no, no. And, it, you know, and we thought we had three months. So we'd worked on the theory that we were doing it in the right time. And then he was born at 37 weeks. So we had a little bit less time than we thought. So that made it challenging initially because it, the milk wasn't fully in. And then my wife's milk came in and she was like, I have this screaming baby and I'm like freaking out because my boobs are going to explode and and I'm not feeding him. You know, like we both had this kind of weirdness around like once someone's nipples been in that mouth, no one else's should until he's at least 20. Like that's not, <laughs> not, not a thing. And so she expressed for a little while just to, to kind of let her milk reduce. And so we had him on a bottle as well as breastfed for a little while because he was hungry. He was small and he just wanted to be fed all the time. Yeah, like the the journey was, it's definitely not your typical parental journey. And, you know, there's there's beautiful parts of it too, though. Like our eldest son has always just been really matter of fact about the fact that he has two mums. Like he's been challenged by pe by adults actually more than children. They had like school photos, and one of them was like, "Oh, you know, what does mom do?" And uh, and he was like, "Oh, mom goes to work in an office." And then she's like, "Oh, and what does dad do?" And he's like, "I don't have a dad." And she's like, "Oh, so it's just mum." And he's like, "No, it's mum and mum." And then and she couldn't get her head around it, and she just kept challenging him. And he was just like, "I have two mums and a brother." <laughs> like that was it he was like and and you know he's always he's never felt the need to differentiate between the two of us he understands the biology of it but we're really lucky that for some bizarre reason my children actually look a lot like my nieces and nephews on my side of the family oh wow so they fit 
to look at and my parents bless them have always just been them they're our grandchildren like it doesn't matter how they came about they're they're ours and good yeah so we're really lucky in that respect but uh yeah it's it's a journey like parenthood on itself is like a freaking roller coaster but this is like <laughs> going on a roller coaster backwards because you're kind of just never really sure like what's around the corner and whether it's going to look the same as it does for everyone else or whether it's going to be a little bit different you know yeah um, and having two boys feels like a weighty sort of responsibility for two women but i think well for us we have a firm belief that patriarchy must die and uh, <laughs> that that we're not by any stretch men haters we love some of the men in our lives and you know we we think our our boys are going to be fantastic men but it's really important to us that they grow up with a, a more feminine approach than perhaps we might have been raised with if we'd been boys you know and we're lucky that there are other people in the world doing the same thing and so it's not you know it's not frowned upon or looked at as are oh, you doing something really weird or unusual it's actually just no we just want them to be good people and that requires them to have that balance of of masculine and feminine and you know yeah it's interesting like they had to learn how to pee standing up at school like that wasn't something i was going to teach them um, <laughs> and stuff like that you know but uh, apart from that like the they just carry on and and do everything work it all out themselves and yeah you know i think that makes them better rounded humans to be honest that they they kind of have to learn through trial and error and problem solving for themselves a little bit rather than being shown something and told this is the way that's that's a, a, a definite plus side for me around parenting with with another woman it sounds like they're very lucky to have two moms <laughs> yeah <laughs> well yeah we, we think so, but um, yeah, yeah we're, we're biased. <laughs> <laughs> but I still haven't asked you the, the question of the episode or the podcast, which is, have you ever felt like you were failing motherhood? Oh, every day. <laughs> every day I do something that I'm like, dang, is that going to fuck them up for life? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there is a way to fail motherhood, if I'm honest. I think we feel it mm -hmm. all the time. There is nothing that we will be harder on ourselves for than how we raise our children, I don't think. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that's a lot of conditioning around that, that we place our value in the world based on how our children grow up. I think we underestimate the influence that the external world has on children these days. And for me, I'm like, if my children don't grow up to be awful humans who hate other people and you know, who like want to hurt people or do things that are really damaging, then actually I have done everything possible to, to be a good parent. And because, you know, if you allowed them to just soak in what the world puts in front of them, that's the kind of person they would be. I fail a lot. <laughs> my kids go to school and my youngest, he gets himself dressed, bless him, and <laughs> everybody knows it. Like he'll wear a, a a sock that comes to his knee that's bright pink, and then he'll wear a little orange ankle sock on the other side, and <laughs> you know, and they'll get to school, and my eldest is just absolutely hopeless at sorting himself out, and so he'll get to school, and he'll be like, "I left my drink bottle." I'm like, "No, you didn't. It's in the side of your bag. I put it there." And then he's like, oh, I didn't bring my mask. I'm like, it's around your neck, friend. Like, <laughs> you, you're good. And, you know, and so I think, like, there are definitely times when you think that you failed them. I think that's that's the sign that you're not. If you think that you're failing them, that's the sign that you're not because it shows that you actually really are invested in the outcome. Yeah. And you can't fail if that's the case, right? So, yeah. That's the quote right there. Just – Take that. Cool. I'll just drop drop my mic on the floor. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's so true, though. That's the whole heart of the, the podcast. It's a, exactly what the, I'm trying to normalize is, yeah, we all are going to have, if you care, if the outcome matters to you, then of course yeah. you're going to feel like there is reason to be concerned and you're going to scrutinize and analyze and feel guilt for and, you know, all of these residual things. But those aren't the accurate representation of what's going on. That's just like your brain panicking over the fear of, yeah. you know, the insecurity of not having a guarantee on, on all these outcomes and just wanting the best and the most for your kids. Yeah. Like that's the sign of a good parent. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you think that you're going to fail at parenthood, then you're buying into the message that there is 
failure as an option, and I don't think there is. I, I think every every child will grow up and feel like their parents are responsible for some good stuff and some bad stuff. I mean, that's part of the human condition, right? And and I, yeah, I just don't see it as a like yeah. I, of course, I feel like I fail all the time, but I I certainly don't hold myself to account over it. And I'd be mortified if my wife felt that way. So, you know, like, and, and any of my friends, like if they're, you know, in that same headspace, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. one of the first ones to say, dude, look at your kids. Like they're incredible people. So yeah, I think it's, it's just one of those things that we, we hold ourselves to a, a higher standard than we should. And actually like our kids are great, you know, we'll be fine. They are great. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's so much easier to do that for someone else than it is oh, for yourself. Always, always. Yeah, you know, in every <laughs> area of life. Right. Yeah. So, what is it? What is it like being a same-sex couple in New Zealand? Is there discrimination? Like, have you ever? I know you said that there was like restrictions on adoption. Nah, I. We're really lucky. I mean, I, there are some restrictions. We're getting better, and the longer that we have. A, a government like the one we have at the moment, the, the, mm-hmm. the better it will get. But, you know, I mean, we, we've had to navigate the health system. We've had to navigate the education system. You know, we've navigated like family and community and all of those things. And I can honestly say there's never really been a point where I've felt different in my parenting to any of my friends. The health system's always been really great. As soon as you say, oh, no, you know, they're like, oh, what does dad do? I'm like, oh, no, he has two mums. Immediately they start referring to mum rather than dad. The education system, they're like, we know that mum might be interested. Like Father's Day, <laughs> we always get we always get a happy Father's Day, mum. Thanks for being awesome Aww. kind of card. And Mother's Day, there's always two gifts instead of one. And That's that far. Yeah. So, like, we're just really blessed that we have grown in a, a space and, you know, our local community, while it's quite small, seems to attract same-sex couples. There's about four of us in the local community. So even very cool. Like our kids go to school with other kids who have two moms. And so that's a real blessing as well because they just see it as normal. And that's how I want them to see it. Like it's not it's not abnormal. It's just part of, you know, like some, some children are blessed to have two mums. Some children are blessed to have a mum and a dad. Right. Some are blessed to just have a mum or to have grandparents or whatever. As long as they're loved, it doesn't really matter who lives in their home. And that's, that's something that I think as a society here in New Zealand, we're de- definitely getting better with. There, there's still obviously room for improvement, but mm-hmm. it's, it's nice. Like we're, we're married legally. We own a home together. We have children together. Like yeah. we're just ordinary people who happen to both be women. I think it's and it's that's such a privilege. Yeah, to feel normal. Oh yeah, totally. And you know, we look at it now and we feel really blessed that like we've got friends who their children don't even come out anymore. <laughs> right? They're just like, oh yeah, this is my girlfriend. Cool. Like they just come home and just introduce the girlfriend like they don't even need to say, well, actually, I like girls or, you know, and there's such fluidity around that now. And it's just not even really a thing. And I think that's that's the big change that we've seen in our lifetimes is when we, you know, when we were that age, it was huge. Like it was the kind of thing that made us feel like maybe we were better off not even being here. And then to get to this stage now where we're like, actually, we wouldn't care less if our kids came home. With, in fact, sometimes I would rather they bring home a boy because at least I know there's not going to be any grandkids before I'm ready for it, <laughs> right? Like, So, you know, like I, I just think it's it's one of those things where the more that we are open about the fact that we are just living an, a normal life, like I still spend most of my day picking up laundry off the floor, <laughs> doing the dishes, preparing dinner for most kids who won't eat it. <laughs> Like, you know, like I still, I still have to worry about paying the bills and going to the grocery store and all of those things. Like none of that changes, you know, that's just, that's part of life. And I think the more that people understand that, the less there is to fear about it. And I think the fear is what drives that division. Yeah. Just, you know, don't be afraid of us. Yeah. We're not going to try and convert you. Like (laughs) we're just, we're happy living our lives and, and nothing about that is different, you know, like we're in a a happy monogamous long-term relationship. 
that's that's just part of how we how we live, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I I love the idea of of kids not having to come out because that 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 has changed so much in 20 years. I think is such a gift to humanity of like the, you know, hope for the future. Yeah, yeah. Even just the um I think the acceptance of fluidity in terms of identity is really cool because it allows kids to experiment so much more with who they want to be in the world. And, you know, I'm a big believer in how we be is much more important than what we do. And I think, you know, that probably comes for me from a little bit of trauma around how I was in the world when I was younger. But I think now there's so much more freedom to choose how you want to be in the world and what you want to put out into the world in terms of your identity that that can only be a good thing for humanity. It can only be a good thing for the society that we're, you know, trying to shift the paradigm around some of that those toxic behaviors. Yeah. So like I'm really grateful that my children are growing up now. I'm glad they they're not growing up. Not that not that our parents did a bad job. Like that's not what this is saying. It's just that, you know, we have to continue to evolve as a society. And I think that's a big, big part of it is that I don't know if you're into astrology, but if you ever look into um, Pluto and where that is in your chart, like Pluto moves really slowly and it has like big, long periods, like 10, 12 years of being in one sign. And so my generation, which is pretty much the sort of early 70s to the mid 80s, is very much like we are Libra in Pluto. So we're all about being fair. We want the society to be fair. We, we, you know, we desire equality and that kind of thing. The next group along are something completely different, but the children that we are raising, they are the ones who are just basically like finger up to the world. Like we're just going to do it our way and screw you and everything that you came in on. And and I love that. Yeah. I love that for them because the freedom <laughs> that comes with that is just incredible. Yeah. And, you know, it's like every generation kind of takes what they've inherited and improves it in their way. And and we have to be forgiving to the, the parents that came before us who didn't do it our way. But we also then have to be like really forgiving of the children who are coming up behind us and saying, actually, we're going to do it our way. And that's not because they don't respect us. It's because they respect us enough to not try and redo what we did. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really cool to see that actually society is going to change more and more and more, and we're going to get deeply uncomfortable with it. Yeah. But that's kind of how life goes. And if you don't get that, they're not doing their job right. And we didn't do our job right. Yeah. So yeah, it's really cool. And I, I read something the other day that said like, you know, as a millennial, uh, I feel like my parents prepared me for a world that no longer exists. And how true is that for every generation? Because we're just trying to be like, well, here's what I know. And here's what, you know, you should probably know. And then the world changes so rapidly, especially with technology and just all of the like, major, <laughs> major crises and, and things that have happened in the last 20 years. Like the world is not the same world that it was 20 yeah. years ago. So yeah. as a parent, that's very hard to navigate because you're like, well, I don't even know what I don't know. And I don't even know what I need to tell you or like who you're going to be or what's going to be relevant for like the world that I need to prepare you for. So I think like, I think, how do you handle that? <laughs> a good, yeah. a good parent though, right? Like a good parent doesn't try and tell their child how to be or what to do. They say, hey, I actually don't know what you're going to face, mm. but let's face it together. Love that. Like, whatever you do, I'll stand next to you. Yes. Right? I'll hold space for you to fall apart. I'll, I'll be there unpicking it all with you. I'll work out, you know, I'll, I'll do the labor that you need me to do to put it all back together. And I, I think that's really what good parenting is about. We can't tell them what the world is going to be. Mm -hmm. We can't imagine it. Mm -hmm. And the world that they're going to have and inherit from us is is not even thought of yet. Right. So all we can do is prepare them with the tools to navigate whatever comes up and the resilience to say, actually, I know that if everything falls apart, I'm brave enough, I'm bold enough, I'm big enough in the world that I can make it 
whatever I need it to be and that I can be successful no matter what it looks like because success is what I determine it to be, not what someone else tells me it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when we go into that space and and be prepared to stand in that shit with them and say, actually, like, doesn't matter what comes, I always have your back. You can't ask for more than that as a parent. Yes. And you can't give more than that as a parent. Yes. Like that's all they need from us, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's my take. Yeah. And that full, that full acceptance of like, I love you, be you. Yeah. Go and be great. I'll celebrate you. Like I'm the biggest fan of you. Yeah. Yes. Like that, that completely unconditional acceptance because then that places that value in themselves of how they see themselves. And so then they can give that to others. Yeah. Yeah. Then they can go and they can see that inherent value in every other human because it was placed in them first. Yeah. And again, that, yeah. that's, there's nothing more powerful. Exactly. And now conversation's full circle, right? Yeah, totally. Because <laughs> now we're back to that. Like, that's how we're going out into the world. Yes. Is, um, is going out there and just being being prepared to give them the tools to say, actually, you can navigate anything. Yeah. Like, there is nothing in this world that can stop you except you. So as long as you have full faith in yourself, and that is my job as your parent, is to give you that. Mm-hmm. As long as you have that, you're going to go out and do great things. And and that's all the world needs from you. Yeah. So yeah. go forth and prosper, right? Oh my gosh, <laughs> your your boys are so lucky oh, to have you. you. Thank you. I feel like I could, I could talk to you all day. I, I'm going to record that and I'm going <laughs> to play that to them so that oh, they do, actually understand do. it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm and I'm a parenting coach, so I mean that really says a lot, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I might even frame it and put it on the wall. <laughs> Do <laughs> yeah. Well, as as we wrap up, share a little bit more about what you do right now and how listeners could connect with you offline if they wanted to do that. Cool. So I'm a, a self worth mentor and a spiritual healer. I'm a psychic medium, so I work in partnership with a very, very good friend in Awakening the Wise Woman is the name of our business. And we're all about supporting women to kind of embrace their own wisdom and and reconnect with who they really are and, and what they stand for so that they can go out into the world and make a meaningful contribution. And, you know, I'm obviously a psychic medium, so I'm very woo, I'm very spiritual, and and I connect very much with the the energies of the universe and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, Ellie is a a qualified coach. So we have both aspects of humanness and and spiritual self. And so awakeningthewisewoman.com is where you can find me most of the time. And um, yeah, it's, it's a real gift to be able to do that with women who are trying to, you know, navigate motherhood and all of that sort of thing as well. So that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. What, Oh, what links do you see between your work and how your clients, how it affects their parenting? I think like the thing is when we, when we know what our own core values are, when we really get clear on, on who we are and, and what we stand for, like what we are prepared to stand on the hill and say, this is the thing that I cannot be moved from that allows us to then use that information to navigate parenting so as an example, one of my big core values is connection, right? I firmly believe that part of the problem with humans is that we've stopped connecting with each other on a deeper level than, hi, how are you going? How's the weather? And so connection is really important for me. And so that's part of my parenting. I make sure that I connect with my children regularly. I offer them opportunities to connect with their friends regularly. Um, and I instill in them the value that actually connecting with other people is is part of how we make the world a better place to be. And and so knowing that about myself, I can lead with that in my parenting. And so, yeah, like when we know what we are prepared to stand for and what we are prepared to do, we, we're bigger and we're braver and we're bolder in the world. We have more clarity and confidence. And all of those things, I think, when we can model those for our children, enable them to step into those roles when they're ready and and actually do their thing and make their contribution. And there's nothing that I want more for my children than for them to live a purposeful, meaningful life and to feel like they have space in the world where they matter. And so that's 
very much where the link I think comes from. We work with women. We predominantly work with women who are parents and that's, that's a, a big part of what we do. I love that. It makes so much sense. That that's one thing I, I do with my clients is, you know, finding your family's core values yeah, and your, you know, culture of your home and things, because how can you embody that and teach that and instill that without identifying it in the first yeah. place and yeah. stepping into that? And yeah, so underrated. And it's so interesting how much of that we take on from society without really testing whether it's true for us or not. And I think that's something that we do a lot of. Obviously, you know, I've got the spiritual aspects of that and the energetic aspects of that, but connecting with intuition and natural cycles and all of that sort of stuff and changing the way that we live allows us to embody that at a much deeper level. And and that kind of transformation is so important, especially for women, I think, in the sort of 35 to 50 bracket when they're like, okay, I've had the children and I've got the husband and or the wife and I've got the life and I've got the house and all of the things, but I feel like there's more that I want and I feel really guilty that I want it. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it's about saying, actually, you don't have to feel guilty because there is more. What you are in the world isn't the sum of all of the roles that you play. What you are in the world is you. And that deserves space too. And we don't give it to us. Yeah. So yeah, it's really, really important. And I love the fact that there are people like you helping women feel more empowered in the space of parenting, because I think that's the one space, like I said, that we hold ourselves to account the most. And the standard is so high. Impossibly. Yes. That like we set ourselves up to fail all the time. Right. right. Exactly. And again, for full circle with the, with the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, then, now I have to grill you on the last question. The question I ask every guest that comes on and you've been thinking about it in the back of your head this whole time. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. <laughs> the mom that your kids need. I'm not. I'm so not. My wife probably is more than I am. I, you know, I said to you before, I think I'm not the mother that they need, but they're for sure the children that I need. I learn so much from my children every single day. My eldest is the most incredible, like he's just so conscious of energy and and spirituality. And like he, he, from a really young age, took himself off to meditate and bring himself back into his body. And like, I learned so much about that stuff from him. And then my younger son is just, he's so curious about the world and he wants to experience so many things and he's a Scorpio. So his emotions are like arm's length from his body all the time. And they're so big. And that gives me permission to explore my own emotions and, and things. And I, I just, I had a friend who said to me once that the only, like you only ever get given the children that you can handle. And I think there's, there's some truth in that, but I think we have to learn so much in order for that to be true. Yes. And so we have to just go into it with the willingness to explore who we are and who they are and how like how we can learn from them and be better people because of them. So I'm I'm not sure that I'm the parent that they need all the time. I make mistakes all the time and they freely tell me. <laughs> but they are definitely the children that I needed to be a better person and to be a better woman and yeah, I I I couldn't ask for more from my children than what I get from them because they're loving, wise, compassionate little human beings who contribute to the world in ways that I couldn't even perceive before they came along. So Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a blessing. Yeah. It's such a blessing. Well, I, I've I ventured about that you become even more the parent they need one day at a time. Oh, you know, yeah. By the time they're 40, they'll probably be like, yeah, you're the parent I need. The one I needed 30 years ago. In a rest home, <laughs> in another country, like miles away. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Or, you know, when, the, when, the, when they have the grandkids and they're like, oh, I just need you to look after them for like a week, <laughs> then I'll be the parent that they need. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if our children really ever think about what they need from us. Yeah. They just kind of expect that it's there. They just have their person. And yeah, so yeah, I'll, one day I might get there. We'll see. Well, thanks. Thank you again for taking the time. Thank you. Being honest and vulnerable and sharing your story. It's just so beautiful and needed. And uh, now, you know, when I come visit New Zealand, 
We'll meet up if you, you know, swing around Nebraska in your world tour. Let me know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll meet up and our kids will play. Yeah. Well, we'll get close. We'll get close. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. But thanks again, Erin. Um, and, you know, who knows? We might even meet up in Paris sometime. That, we yeah. could do that. Let's, yeah. That sounds that like That sounds like option. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. But thank you so much for the invite and for the, the great conversation. I appreciate what you're doing and, and being part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Failing Motherhood. Your kids are so lucky to have you. If you loved this episode... Take a screenshot right now and share it in your Instagram stories and tag me. If you're loving the podcast, be sure that you've subscribed and leave a review so we can help more moms know that they are not alone if they feel like they're failing motherhood on a daily basis. And if you're ready to transform your relationship with your strong-willed child and invest in the support you need to make it happen, schedule your free consultation using the link in the show notes. I can't wait to meet you. Thanks for coming on this journey with me. I believe in you and I'm cheering you on.